Our scripture today is from 2 John. We've been through 1 John, now 2 John. We'll do 3 John and Jude, but we are at verse 4. Let me read those verses for you today. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we've worked for, but may win a full reward. You can be seated. Um, we're looking at John's second letter. It may have actually been a cover letter for 1 John. Last week we learned that, uh, or I reminded you that John calls himself the elder because he's providing spiritual oversight for many house churches in Asia Minor. Most likely he's embedded in the church in Ephesus, which Paul would have started 50 some odd years earlier. He's an old man and he's the last remaining eyewitness and disciple of Jesus Christ. He was called by Jesus Christ, right? Can you imagine that? He was called by the mouth of Jesus the Christ. He, he walked and talked with Jesus the Christ. He listened to Jesus the Christ. He touched him. He was reprimanded by him. He watched him die on a cross. He was given the responsibility from Jesus to care for his mother. He was a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was taught from and by the mouth of the resurrected Christ. He was present in the upper room when the Holy Spirit created the church. So we are blessed to have some of the final correspondence to the church of Christ by this apostle. In 1 John, we talked a lot about love and truth played a minor role. It was kind of a minor key. In, in 2 John, 3 John, and in Jude, truth will step forward into the spotlight and make himself known. John is concerned that his brothers and sisters in Christ will be pulled away from the essential truths of the gospel and God as seen through Jesus Christ and fall away therefore into apostasy and be lost. We see the word truth, aletheia in Greek, four times in the first three verses last week, remember? John says that he loves this church in the truth, also all who know the truth, because the truth abides in us. And then he blesses them with grace, mercy, and peace from God and his son in truth and love, four times in three verses. And then he begins our section today, this morning in verse four, by saying, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. And here John is beginning to present a joy and a burden. Any real pastor of Jesus Christ, any real elder will tell you that the greatest joy is to see or to witness, they might say, their people walking in the truth. Really, it's God's people, but it's amazing to see. When you see someone who cares deeply about the truth, wants to study it on their own, take notes of sermons, right? Or do devotionals and take notes, dig into the word fully, fully. And then you begin to see that take root as that individual becomes more secure in their identity in Christ and they begin to produce fruit. They serve the body, they live lives above reproach. They don't gossip, they won't slander. They're forgiving always. They're at peace with all people as much as it depends on them. And then to see that person become softer and not harder because truth of Christ should make us softer and more gentle, more loving, more consistent in our acts of love to the church and the body of Christ, to commit to participating in the church of Christ more and to make her more beautiful. People that keep leaving churches say, well, there's not many people like me. Well, that's why you're there, right? To make the bride more beautiful. So I think it's important that when John says something like this, I rejoice to find some of your children walking in the truth. Yes, there's joy, but when he talks about walking in the truth, that means something entirely different than if it would have been from the mouth of a Pharisee or a Sadducee, right? Or even maybe different from what you think it means because you may have been subject to spiritual abuse in the church or her leaders in the past. So I want you to know that when he's talking like this, walking in the truth, he's not talking about dancing or having an alcoholic beverage or the length of your skirt, ladies. Those are all wisdom questions. Remember, truth are the keys of the piano and wisdom is the music that we make. You can make a billion songs, 
from the same keys of truth, but the keys are always the keys. Too many churches have been upset just by different music people are playing instead of saying, well, that's not really a truth, it's okay. John is talking about the keys. In other words, he's, he's asking this question all through 1 John, are you a Christian? John's keys are not burdensome. Truth, love, and life change. Truth, love, life change. We might say doctrine, relationship, and ethics. Are, are those coming together? Now, John would say the piano is Jesus Christ or, or God as seen through Jesus Christ, that Jesus came to reveal the Father and there is no way to the Father except through the Son. You can't even see a piano in the room except something happens to you. It's the grace of God and it's the love of God and it's the problem of a broken truth reconciled by God as seen on the cross. And John was there for it all. You see, it was revealed to him. So therefore truth is light, he would say. It's revelation and without it, you stay, we stay in the darkness. So for John, the truth that he has mentioned literally in writing is only a few things, and we're going to talk about them a little bit. Last week, I talked about truth being the foundation of the church, and that without it, the church is not really a church of Christ. Well, can I remind us that John nor I have been talking about things like complementarianism or egalitarianism or the truth of paedo-baptism or credo-baptism or the truth about continuationism and cessationism. And if you don't know what those words mean, thank you. <laughs> when we come across those texts, they are debated. They're gray areas. I will share my views on them, not to say that I don't have opinions on all of those things. But the Bible doesn't mention them as areas for disfellowship or areas about which people must agree in order to be included or excluded from a community of faith, nor will I, nor will your elders, who, by the way, may have differing views on all of those areas of theology. Those are not essential doctrines. And it's not what I was talking about last week when I mentioned that truth is the foundation of the church, nor is it what John means when he says that he's rejoicing that some in the church are walking in the truth. So for John, Let's talk about what he's talking about. He's only mentioned really three pieces of doctrine of essential nature, not that there's more, not more there are, but this is what he's addressing, where he would say, if you agree with these doctrines, now you may be a Christian, right? Because that's only part of it. But if you don't agree, you are not a Christian. You're a false, you're a fake Christian, you're an antichrist, he would say. So obviously I agree with John because I believe in the Bible and the authority of the word. So here they are. If you don't believe these things this morning and you say you're a Christian, you're not. The man Jesus is the Christ. So Jesus the man is also the Messiah of the world. Secondly, the son of God has been incarnated as a human being. So God became flesh. Now people in their church were saying that God indwelled flesh, right? that flesh became godly. But no, God was already from the beginning and he became human. Third, the death of his son is our atonement for sin. Some people don't like to talk about the wrath of God and so they try to make the cross something different. John says, if you do that, you've destroyed the cross. There's a payment to satisfy God's wrath and that was done on the cross. Now that's it so far. And John has great joy to find that some of them are walking in these truths, which means they're being worked out into behavioral and relational aspects, ethical aspects, so that he can say or see these are real Christians. They really do believe these things. Again, I think the joy of every real pastor or elder in a church is when that happens. But secondly, there's also a deep burden here. And the burden for John is what gives motivation for this letter, only some of the children, only some are walking in the truth. And that is in fact why John is writing this letter. He wants more to walk in the truth. And that's, that's why John wants, he sees this poison and he thinks this letter might provide an antidote for that poison spur them on into the truth and help them make decisions that will protect the church. So you can see by only some are walking in the truth, we're getting to why he's writing this letter. This church does not have a love problem, at least not by the world's definition. They have a truth problem. And that truth is 
changing the definition of love or at least competing with the definition of love. Truth and love are competing so that people are choosing love, which in their day is hospitality and acceptance over truth. And so as I mentioned last week, John has to bring those two things back together and express how love, not defined by truth, is never really loving. And truth, not defined by the love revealed in Jesus Christ, is not really truthful. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to break up this section in the exact way it flows. I think it's two verses for each point. Let's talk about John's request first and then John's warning to the church. A request for us, the church, and then a warning for us, the church. John begins by saying, I, I now ask you, dear lady, and you can tell John is engendering affection with the church, his audience, and showing his great love for the church. The dear lady means beloved lady. So you see how that softens it a little bit. And by the way, John can say this because even though some have been deceived and even fallen away, and some are false Christians corrupting the church, there's still a dear lady there, right? There's always a hidden redeemed. There's always what the Bible calls a remnant. And John is addressing those Christians who are in the midst of a probable greater body being poisoned by false doctrine. And just we might need to remember as a church that when we talk about other churches, like the whole bodies, there's probably a dear lady, even in the most corporately corrupt religious environment. There's probably a dear lady or two there. And then he says this, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning that we love one another. Now, the part that says that we love one another is clear to us. He's mentioned that last week. They're going to agree with that. We agree with that. Our world agrees with that. We disagree on nothing. It's love, 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 love. But also, John is reminding us by saying from the beginning, and he keeps saying that, he's telling you that he's not an innovator. Does that make sense? He's not coming up with it. Have you noticed that all cults and all antichrists, we would say today, all false teachers are always innovators? They add scripture, they add to it, they take away, they reinterpret it. They talk about the hidden knowledge that was given to them alone at 2 a.m. in the morning by an angel. And therefore, now they're going to rewrite the Bible themselves or that the, they were doing their devotionals and the Spirit showed them a new way to interpret the Scripture that nobody else has understood through breathing exercises and mental transportation. And I've been to some of those type of Bible studies and I've, I've seen people close their eyes and say something like, oh, I picture Jesus right here sitting next to his disciples in this crowded dark upper room over candlelight drinking wine with his disciples and the bitter taste of the wine and it's such a dark and okay fine but the room was really big and the men were probably reclining on benches eating a full meal with women wives and children like you don't need to bake up your own image or, or they close their eyes and they go oh okay this scripture I picture Jesus talking his disciples all day and it's hot and the sand is pushing up through his toes and uh, he's sweating and they're tired and it's like all day to get to the next village and now this scripture makes more sense when he talks about hard toil and labor and I'm sitting there going great that's really cool but that was actually an incredibly rocky walk and it's at high altitude and he was probably very cool and Jesus wore sandals and it only took them an hour to get to the next village. Like, you don't need to have special spiritual knowledge for this. You can do the work. Right? And so many people who are false teachers are always innovators. Always God showed them something that you can't see. Trying to look for different or special knowledge that nobody else has. Those were the deceivers in John's church still today. John says, what I'm telling you about, we've had from the beginning. See, this isn't a twist on, this isn't John's Christianity twist. It's not an ethical or relational novelty. It's not hidden mystery. It comes right from Jesus, who he hung with. So to accept Jesus as the Messiah and God's son means accepting what he says. Now, in a way, it was new knowledge for John because it was revealed through Jesus Christ. But it was also old knowledge that, John, that Jesus made new by his life. 
Let me read the scripture for you that John's talking about when he talks about something that began Christianity that was not new. It's from the beginning of your Christianity. You knew this. But John was in the upper room, chapter 13, and John recorded this, verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. You see that new commandment part? Jesus came in part to reveal what love looked like. But the loving one another part wasn't new. Moses had already said it in Leviticus 19, 18. It was so revered a law in their day, it was thought of as, as the second greatest commandment in the scripture. The next one was, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Number two is, love your neighbor as yourself. So the newness of this commandment that Jesus give, is giving is not the ethical standard. It was that part where he says, as I have loved you. That was newly revealed by Jesus. In other words, we didn't know God's love for us until we saw Jesus. Jesus in his own life and ministry and teachings and death had provided John the index and the measure of what real love is. Jesus had loved them all fully in his three years. He washed their feet in the upper room. That's a new view of love, that you serve others beneath you, that you take the lowest role, you know, role in the room. They would, all, you know, they would all betray Jesus, but Judas was there and he washed the feet of his betrayer. That's a new vision of love. You serve even one who will turn his back on you. He sweat, drips, he sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane as he held on to his obedience and the will of his father more than he loved himself. That's a new vision of love, that kind of obedience. He was nailed to a cross to provide a way of forgiveness, dying even for those who spat at him and mocked him and nailed spikes into his hands and feet. Like that's the newness of the love, as he's saying, a new commandment, as you're watching me love you, so love one another. That's, a, that's, a, that's the revelation of the cross. And Christians in the, who became Christians in the first century knew that new revelation. That's from the beginning, this, this kind of love. Remember John in 1 John, oh, what great love the Father has for us that we should be called children of his. That was true in the Old Testament, though, just as much as it was in the New Testament. It's just that people couldn't see it until Jesus came. So Christ came not as a, a separate entity of his Father. People do that all the time. It's like, uh, you know, Jesus is like, yeah, my dad, he's like always upset, you know, like he's, he's mean, but I'm really kind and loving. No, Jesus Christ came to reveal and testify to the Father's love for humanity that they couldn't see until Jesus. And now they could go back in the Old Testament and actually understand it. One more thing I want you to see about this request is that notice that it's a commandment to love. It came from Jesus to, to, to his disciples, from the apostles to the church, to our church, which means, doesn't this mean that love cannot be reduced to a feeling or an emotion? Or else it couldn't be a commandment. Jesus didn't feel like going to the cross, right? So it's a command from Jesus to love this way means to serve the body of Christ as Christ served all of us, to put ourselves below one another, to serve, to love, to the kind of love experienced by the Apostle John when he walked with Jesus, one who was a, sund a thunder, right? And he became the, the apostle, the, the one that Jesus loved. So John's request is for the church to love one another, right? We get that. But now, because he thinks that you and I might misunderstand that, which we do, he goes to the next verse, which I believe is one of the most important verses for our church today, in any church. He's, he begins in verse 6. And this is love, okay? You have to stop there. Love equals, and this is the definition of love because people don't know that, what it means to love one another. Walk according to his commandments. This is such an important concept for the church. You see, love is, love equals means that we don't get to say what love is, doesn't it? We don't get to define truth. We don't get to define love. These things were given to us from outside of our realm of existence. I saw a comic strip on a website called nakedpastor.com <laughs> and Jesus is standing there, you know, he always looks beautiful and sweet and kind and he's talking to a group of very conservative church people, you could tell because they're all sitting, they're standing there with their suits and they're holding big Bibles and they're looking all stiff, just like he wants them to look. 
And Jesus, the cool one, says to these church people, the difference between me and you is you use scripture to determine what love means and I use love to determine what scripture means. Oh yeah, bro, like that's so wrong. And that's the battle today for truth. The church is so afraid of being seen as unloving that we have many times given up our mandate to provide truth in a world where the great deceiver reigns supreme. If you go to that site, nakedpastor.com, please, you can go if you want, you'll see how far they have left the truth. Why? Because they don't really believe that God is love. What they believe is love is God. Love is not God. God is love. Not the other way around. John was right there when Jesus said, John, John uh, recorded it in John chapter 14. Jesus says, if you love me, you see, he's defining love. You will obey my commands. All the commands of God, all the do's and the do nots are all loving. Now, I know we live in a world today that wants to be free of stuff like that. But when the roller coaster attendant brings the lap bar down, and then comes over to you and checks that it's locked. That's an act of love. It's not suppressing your freedom. He's giving you life. And so many today are like a branch on this great glorious tree of Christianity that has deep roots in the ground, grown in blood. And they just rip their branch off the tree and shove themselves in a different ground and say, there, I will grow my own way. This is what my tree will look like. Now, do you think that branch is gonna flourish? or die. Love is not sentimentality. It's not empathy only. It has a definition. Let me share with you some of the definitions of love because there are many in the scripture. All of the one another's in the scripture are telling us how to love one another, right? So this is what love means in part. It means if you cause strife in my life, I will be patient with you. It means if you come to me with a request or desire or even to challenge me, you should see that I will submit to you. Even if I'm wrong. Even if you're wrong. It means if you're struggling, I will encourage you. It means if you're bearing hardship, I will bear it with you. It means if I see sin in your life, I will pray for you and I will bring it to your attention. It means if you're grieving, I will grieve with you. If you're rejoicing, I will rejoice with you. It means if you have an incorrect understanding of essential doctrine, I will instruct you. It means if you stumble, I will help to pick you up. It also means if you're willingly disobedient to God's word or preach a different gospel than the one that they preach, just like Paul said, I will confront you. And absent of repentance and correction, I will break fellowship with you as Christian breaks fellowship with darkness. Why? Because love has been defined for us. And all of the things that I just mentioned, some of them you went, yay, and some of them you went, ugh. All of them were in the life of Jesus Christ. Every time he, and he was love. Love's not our God. God is love. If you wanna know how to love, you must know God. You must know his word. You must know his decrees, his laws, his commandments. And this is the issue John is trying to correct. Why? Because one of the loving one another things in the scripture is to show hospitality, to let people in, to, to take care of them. And so, what, and so the question here for this church is what happens when a love command conflicts with truth? Have any of you experienced that in your own life? When you're like, I wanna be loving, but, but I wanna be truthful. How do I do that? What does it mean? Where are the boundaries? Well, that was happening in this church. We're going to talk next week about how John handled that. Let's move on to the warning. And um, I wish we had more time for this, but I'm just going to run through this warning because it's a warning for our church as well. Verse 7 says, Many deceivers have come out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. John's the only author in the Bible who uses the phrase antichrist. It means literally against Christ. He uses it in 1 John. He uses it in the book of Revelation. It's one of the many reasons we know he wrote all of those books. 
But it seems like John is trying to protect his house churches from those who had broke away from the church that he mentioned, by the way, in, in uh, Revelation. But he, we think that those people might have broken away from his home church. And the one John says, if you remember that, well, they left us, but they were never with us, meaning they were never Christians anyway. They've come out and now they're going to find other churches to spread their poison. Now, we're going to bring context to this next week as we end first John, or Second John when we talk about hospitality and how important it was in their culture for loving one another. But there was a circuit of house churches in Asia Minor that provided food, love, care, attention, service. And as you can imagine, in a, in a day of extreme poverty, that was as good a way as any to make a living. Right? And so, especially if you said, I'm a Christian... And especially now, you could provide teaching. You might be really intelligent, and you could offer something back to the community, your knowledge, your teaching. And once embedded in that home, as a traveling Christian teacher, you could do all sorts of damage. I don't know if you've ever seen that in a church, but imagine a house church with 10, 12, 15 people, and you get two or three people starting to think another way, and three or four or five, and now the whole thing is damaged. By the way, I was thinking a lot this week how the same thing happens in our homes today. But it's not traveling preachers. It's much more prevalent and accessible than in John's church. And as pastors and as elders, if we went after this, it would definitely be play, like trying to play whack-a-mole. Right? There's so much untruth out there. What are we going to do? Jump on every Facebook and Instagram post and come into your home and look at your, your books, you know? Now, I, I, some of you... Th- think, uh, which, by the way, I wish I could, but here's why. Some of you think, pastors, elders, why don't you leave people alone? Like, let them purchase whatever books they want. Let them read what they want about Christianity. Let them listen to whatever blog or podcast they want to listen to. But that fails to recognize that biblically, that's the job of an elder. Elders are God's agents to protect the church against false teaching teach the truth of scripture themselves and rebuke those who contradict it. Titus 1, 9, Acts 20, 28 through 31, 1 Timothy 3, 2, 1 Timothy 5, 17. It's John's job to do this and it's elders' jobs to do this. Now, John is concerned about three ways people are defiling the gospel by attacking the identity of Jesus Christ. But there are other ways of course that we can defile the truth and people listen to podcasts and buy bibles or books from people that don't believe all of these things which by the way i almost started to list a bunch of authors and you know podcasts i said no i'm not going to do that don't want to make people mad but here are some of the things holy god is three father son holy spirit belief in the incarnated jesus the messiah born from the Virgin Mary. God was made man, crucified, suffered death, buried, rose on the third day, ascended into heaven in redeemed flesh, seated at the right hand of God, will someday judge the living and the dead, that the Holy Spirit indwells those who have been chosen from the beginning of time. Christians themselves will be resurrected from the dead, that we are saved by faith and not works. And all of those that I've mentioned are essential And the reason we can say they're essential is because of the essential doctrine that the scripture is authoritative and God breathed, wholly true and inerrant, and that the original manuscripts do not affirm anything that's contrary to fact. In other words, we don't get to make them up. We all go to the Bible for the same essential truths. John says, know who they are. Don't be fooled in your love. John says, do your work. Know those who are false. Now, I want you to know, so you don't think I'm being completely mean, this isn't talking about your relationship with the world, is it? Like, it, the world is the world. You don't watch a worldly movie or read a worldly book to learn about Jesus Christ. You might do that, and you might even find Jesus Christ appearing in those things. It's not about having a guest in your home that's a non-Christian, right? That's all loving We're talking about people who say they're Christians, but they're going to tell you that they're different kinds of Christians. I hear this all the time. Oh, you poor, unenlightened 
ancient, you know, non-progressive, stale, conservative, legalistic people, you know. We're more progressive. We're more enlightened. We're more free. We're more encouraging of radical self-love because if you don't love yourself, how can you love anybody? Scriptures are beautiful. No, they're not inerrant, but they're beautiful ancient passages passed down by our forefathers. But they're not authoritative in our world today because they're flaws. Besides, the Bible's a living document. We're still writing it today. And all that stuff is poison for the church. You know what is not poison for a church? A Marvel movie. Right? So I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about people who say we're Christians and we want you to know how to do it well. It's different than what you think. Well, it's not. It should be from the beginning. Same thing. Finally, verse 8, a stern and full warning. He says, watch yourselves. That's really strong there. Watch yourselves. Not watch the other person next to you. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. It's very unlikely that John is speaking of levels of rewards in heaven and that people who fall away are simply missing out on their full reward, but their salvation is secure. We know that not only because of what other scriptures say, but because John's going to continue and tell us what that means to miss a full reward. But John is not doing anything here that Jesus Christ didn't do himself when he spoke on this earth. And again, I almost missed, uh, listed all of these scriptures, but in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus often talked about ways to walk, ways to follow him, ways to live in order to receive a full reward. And then he would talk about living outside of that light provided by himself, the Christ. And then he would say things like, for them there is no reward. Or he would say, they've already received their reward, right? Or he would say their reward will be that they're eternally lost. Now, this does not mean that our salvation is through or by good works. But it cannot be denied that there was in the early church an apostolic exhortation to believe that ethical behavior, how we act, is one of the ways that it shows a sign and a promise of eternal life on a person's soul. God can never let go of a Christian. We know that. But John obviously feels that falling away into false teaching is a sign of an individual or a group of people letting go of God because they're letting go of the apostolic teaching of Christ. Right? Notice John saying, I don't want you to lose what we have worked for. Notice he says we plural. I don't want you to lose what we have worked for. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about God. Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross for you. He's talking about the apostles. He's talking about John himself. John has watched now as all of his dear brothers have been killed for this gospel over the years. To, to talk about the same gospel. Nobody changed it and they were being killed for it. Apostolic Christianity had nothing going for it. Roman opposition, Greek opposition, Jewish opposition, right, for different reasons, because either they believed in all gods or they would say, no, there's only a God in heaven. There's not some God in the flesh, the Jewish would believe, some human God. Family split apart, brothers against parents, parents against brothers. And so John's saying, we've worked hard for this. There's blood all over the ground because this is what we're telling people about Jesus Christ, because we were there. By the way, even today, the effort to be a true Christian, today, right now, sitting where you're at has not been yours alone, even if you think it has been. There are elders in our midst today who are in suffering and have made great time and effort to still shepherd their flock. There is a staff who have spiritually, emotionally, physically been under constant attack the last six months. There are teenagers who woke up this morning early and set up chairs. Also, older people who are struggling with disease, setting up chairs slowly. There are, teen there are teenagers who are teaching your little children. People who have been arriving early for 19 years in this church so far and staying after to make this building presentable for you and the Lord's work. Youth leaders who go on long trips and stay up late at night with your teenagers to listen to them and love them unconditionally. People have probably showed up at your door with food when you're suffering or your spouse is pregnant or to help you move your furniture in a moment's notice. Up come the trucks from eternal. 
There are people who have called you, who've cried with you, who have rejoiced with you, who've showed up to cast demons from your home. Do not believe the lie that you are an autonomous Christian. No one is. Don't give up what we have worked so hard for. How dare you possibly give it all up just because you really like what Marcus Borg and Richard Rohr have to say? I just mentioned two, didn't I? <laughs> Rachel Held Evans and Lamont. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Brian McLaren. Um, this, this lose your reward bit always throws off Reformed Christians. But, you know, look, John doesn't know who the elect are. I heard John MacArthur once say, it'd be a lot easier to preach if I knew who the elect were. John doesn't know. Paul doesn't know. I don't know. What your elders here know, what I know, what your members know, is God has asked all of us to exhort, encourage, correct, rebuke, and clarify. Why? Because the Lord has chosen to use a faithful church out of his grace to participate in the salvation of his bride. We plant the seed that is not ours. We water the plant that is not ours. And God must make it grow, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. What we do know is if you leave behind the true Jesus, the apostolic Christ, and the truth of the Bible, a real biblically defined truth in Jesus, you leave the possibility of relationship with God behind. I've been asked more than a few times by congregants, probably four or five times since I've been here, because they'll hear a sermon and they'll come up and say, so do you believe in once saved, always saved? And uh, I hate that question. I hate it because of the dogma present on either side of that little phrase. It's like, it's like if I say yes, it's like, oh, good, you're like I'm part of the special club of people who get it. And if I say no, there's a oh, sigh of relief that I'm not in that special club. You can't sum up the complexity of salvation in a pithy statement like once saved, always saved. I believe the Bible. And the missing emphasis of those who want a quick affirmation of a phrase like once saved, always saved, is that they miss the biblical fact that a Christian is saved through perseverance, not apart from it. It's perseverance of the saints. It is as we persevere that we are saved. It's loyally believing. It's holding on. The soil of our salvation, the seed, is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The evidence of that that seed has taken root and is a real plant is that there is perseverance to the end. And you say, well, is that up to our work? No, it's the grace of God as well. You know why I know that? Because it's the grace of God that you have a Bible. It's right in front of you, maybe. It's at home. That's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that you have a covenant community of believers who will love you as Christ loved the church. It's a grace of God that you have a communion that we will partake in as a communion of remembrance with our Lord Jesus Christ. There's, it's a grace of God that there's a covenant of baptism to remind us continually of decisions for Christ. It's the grace of God that you have teachers and preachers who care more about God's word than anything else. It's the grace of God that you have prayer as a means of grace to speak to him through the Holy Spirit and have his presence, just you alone in your house can do that, an advocate in heaven. So if what you mean by once saved, always saved is God has set this table of grace and he's just going to shove it in your mouth, I don't believe in that. If you think I can listen to what I want to, I can do what I want, I can be what I want to be, that's not assurance, that's presumption and arrogance and entitlement. Why is John writing this letter if that kind of once saved, always saved is true? He thinks he can make a difference. You can't just say the elect are the elect and sit back. That's not how anyone acted in the New Testament, even if that statement is true from a 30,000 foot view. Now to the other side this morning, I'm gonna end poking you. If what you mean by saying that you do not and will never believe in once saved, always saved, is that it depends on the individual, that you, you have to eat the meal, and it's your, and you're eating the meal, that that's why you're in heaven. And what happened to you could happen to anybody if they just come to the table and cut it out and listen to people. Just go to church and stop it. 
And you believe that being elect means that God knows who the people are from the beginning who really are going to work hard enough for it. That's not assurance either. That's arrogance and legalism and spiritual brutality when you place it on others. We don't win the reward. What John is talking about is not losing it. And that's a grace of God as we persevere. Look, this is what you need to hear, the side that don't want to hear and once saved, always saved. Jesus Christ came to earth to live a perfect life. Amen? Amen. To be perfectly obedient to his Father, to never let go of God, even in the garden, even on the cross, to walk perfectly before his Father in perfect obedience, and for that, he should have received a what? A full reward. Instead, we learn that he was cast out by his father, hated as a curse by his father, took on our, our sins, and received the full punishment and wrath of God as he drank the cup of wrath down to the dregs. So, let me ask you now a question. Why would he do all of that if we have to do it as well? Which means, and this is what I want to speak over you, none of us in here are going to obey the father perfectly. We're not going to listen to him at times. We're going to go our own way at times. We may even let go of him at times and run away like a prodigal son. And some of us say they're gone for good and they're not. We may go with our will over the Lord's will and most of us probably do that daily. That's the point of his life as a human. To do what I cannot do. So, of course, I'm not saved by my works. And I'm not going to get a full reward because I've done those things well. I'm going to get my full reward because I cling to Christ and him crucified. Amen? We cling to Christ and him crucified. God is not going to punish his son for my sin and then turn around and punish me for my sin as well. That's not a just God. There's one way through this problem, and it's what John doesn't want them to lose, their relationship and faith in Jesus Christ as their savior. Because it's the only means to a full reward. Let's pray. Dear Father, this is a difficult reading. It's a difficult section of John, and he'll continue next week to tell us how to to be more truthful in our actions as, as, and well, as well. And that, and that love can look like shutting the door because we want to protect what we have. Father, help us as a church because this really speaks to us, but it also can feel kind of hard, like yucky. And all of us have been in positions where we really want to love and let people know that we love them and we can still do that with the world. But help us to be more discerning with people who claim to be Christians and who are proclaiming a different kind of Christianity. Help us to shut the door on that and to know that that's loving for our own hearts and for the hearts of the people around us. Help this place to be a place of truth always and a place of love. That our truth will be loving and that our love will be truthful in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.